Okay, so um, I put up here ahead of time review of what the definition of a modular form is. We have to pick an integer k, um, and for each integer we have the notion of a modular form for group SL2Z of weight k. Holomorphic function after half plane satisfies this funky transformation rule for all the matrices in SL2Z, but this rule, it suffices to check our generators for the group. And so this infinite set of equations is the same as these two equations. This is the matrix 1, 1, 0, 1. This is the matrix 0, minus 1, 1, 0. And then we have a condition at infinity going up. The function is bounded. Um, but then by using complex analysis, um, it turns out to be equivalent to the stronger condition that, in fact, the value has a limit as you approach infinity, not merely that it's bounded. Um, and at the end of the previous lecture, I was showing you that from this condition, the modularity condition for the matrix 1, 1, 0, 1, the periodicity and the boundedness near infinity give us a power series representation of every modular form as a series in e to the 2 pi i tau, the most basic holomorphic function that satisfies the <coughs> And um, uh, this is called a Q expansion. We write Q for e to the 2 pi i tau. And the coefficients of this Q expansion are called the uh, Fourier coefficients of the modular form. So if you try to look up tables of modular forms, then um, you'll find that they're described by their Q expansions. Maybe the first 10 coefficients or things like that. And the basic example we gave of, of a interesting non-constant um, modular form was uh, Eisenstein series for every even integer at least four. We have this infinite series. We check the modularity conditions. In these two cases, the analyticity and the validness are uh, more delicate issues of complex analysis. And uh, one of the things we did was we split off the terms where n is zero, and we collected those together. The sum is over positive n. In this case, even, so positive and negative contribute to equal, so you get a 2 out front. And then we can collect the non-zero m and double the sum over the positive m and over all n. And what we would like to do is write down the Q expansion of the Eisenstein series. So all of these terms actually involve the tau, because the m is in 0 here. This is the constant term. Okay, The constant term of the Q expansion, the a naught, is the value as Q goes to 0, or equivalently as tau goes to infinity. And so that, that's this. Okay, so we could say, without doing any calculations, the constant term has to be twice the sum of 1 over n to the k, which is twice the, the Riemann zeta function of k. The higher coefficients um, are not values of the zeta function, but they're related to um, more number theoretic type of divisor sums. So in order to uh, work out the Q expansion, I, I want to write this as a power series in e to the 2 pi i tau. And the idea is to focus on the inner sum. Okay, So let's look, look at this sum here. And so as not to distract ourselves from the m and the tau, which inside the middle, the inner sum is, is fixed. Um, let's just write, write it as a single letter w, w plus n to the k, where w is some point in the upper half plane. We don't really know what to be anything. Um, and notice that this is sort of by construction a periodic function in, well, I would say periodic in W. If you, if you replace n everywhere by n plus 1, you, you don't change the function. Um, and so you might think, well, maybe I can use the theory of Fourier series to, to uh, expand this out. It's sort of a series in e to the 2 pi i, uh, well, tau, or in this case, it was using W. Um, and so there are several ways to get the, the relevant uh, Q expansion. And the one I'm going to mention is, is called, uh, well, here, I'll tell you the results, and then we'll talk about how it's, how it's worked out. Thanks, Sir Gilles. Back. For every point in the upper half plane. Uh, for W in the upper half plane, and Actually, you don't even need it to be even here. And integers k at least 3, you need it to be at least that big to get, to get convergence, absolute convergence. 
this series, which is entirely a, uh, a function of w, right, I said before, if you replace w by w plus 1, you don't change the value. So it's kind of periodic in w. So this can be written as an infinite series. And here it is, minus 2 pi i, all to the k. So for our purposes of interest, for k is even, the minus i doesn't matter. If k is odd, it would matter. Over k minus 1 factorial times the sum over, um, let's see, where, where are we here? Times the sum over n at least 1, n to the k minus 1, e to the 2 pi i n w. Yeah. All right. So, of course, the n is playing different roles on the two sides, but that shouldn't be a problem. Um, and so here is an expansion of this periodic function in w as a series of powers of e to the 2 pi i w. So, if you know about Fourier series, you can imagine that maybe you could set this up with unknown coefficients and use the formulas using integrals for working out the coefficients of a Fourier series to get this. So, how would you prove such a formula? So one idea might be to use Fourier series. It's a general method of expanding functions um, that are periodic as sums of exponentials like this, in some sense. Um, there's a second method. I'm not going to go through the details of either one. The second method I, I, I wrote up in the notes, and that's using the, the Poisson summation formula. Um, and uh, so the Poisson summation formula roughly has the following shape. Well, it has the following shape. It tells you that a sum over all integers of a nice function, if this is suitably nice, so what does that mean? It could be in a very rapidly decaying function. So if you've ever heard of the Schwartz space, functions that decay very rapidly at infinity in both directions, together with all of their derivatives, um, so like Gaussian functions, um, could be considered nice for what I'm about to write down, or functions that are absolutely integrable and continuous and have their Fourier transform with the same properties, could be considered nice. In any case, the Poisson summation formula says for nice functions, the sum of a function over all integers is equal to the sum of the same function uh, over all integers of its Fourier transform. And the Fourier transforms, this is the Fourier transform of a function. You have a function from R to C. The Fourier transform is another function from R to C. And it's given by the, the following formula. Fourier transform at Y, so the original function is f of x, the Fourier transform will call it f out of Y. It's the integral of f of x from minus infinity to infinity of e to the minus, uh, whoop, there are like a million different conventions for the Fourier transform. So it's e to the 2 pi i x y dx. Okay? So the y that the Fourier transform is a function of shows up only here. Okay? So if you're intuiting the function times the complex exponential, the value of that product of the integration variable with the y, over all x, and that function of y is called the Fourier transform of f. And so this identity is saying summing a function over all integers and summing gets Fourier transform over all integers is exactly the same value. So in analysis, there are, as I said before, about a million different conventions for the Fourier transform. Maybe you don't put the 2 pi here. Maybe you put it outside as a 1 over 2 pi or 1 over the square root of 2 pi. Maybe you put a minus sign here. So this is really the nicest I think this is the best definition because the other theorems involving the Fourier transform besides this, like the Fourier inversion formula, it's much nicer, it looks more symmetric if you have it like that. Um, in any case, since we won't be going through the details here, um, it sort of doesn't matter. But uh, I give a calculation here, this is what I would take, so what I would want to do here is, see this is my f of n. So I would want to apply this I want to apply this to the function f of x equals 1 over x plus, oops, excuse me, 1 over 
w plus x to the k. You see, since w is not a real number, it's in the upper half plane, this, this decaying function is defined for all real x. Okay? Um, and so, if you use the Poisson summation formula, you have to compute the Fourier transform of this, and that becomes a matter of complex analysis. I wrote out the details to some extent in the lecture notes. It turns out that the Fourier transform of this function um, actually vanishes at um, y's that are less than or equal to zero, and at y's that are greater than zero, it has a formula that in fact is exactly what you see here at n. So f hat of y for positive y is y to the k minus 1 e to 2 pi i y w times this factor. In any case, I give the calculation in the lecture notes, and this turns out to be the result. Okay. So, uh, so we have this formula for the uh, inner sum in the Eisenstein series. This sum, this doesn't use anything about modular forms. It's just an expansion of this, by construction, periodic function of w uh, as a, essentially, as, as a Fourier series. And so let's use that in the description of the Eisenstein series. Come back over here and work out what the Q expansion of the Eisenstein series is. So so the Eisenstein series, the constant term is twice the zeta function plus twice the sum over m at least 1 of this inner sum, and so we take this formula and we look at it when the w is m tau, an integer multiple of a point in the upper half, positive multiple of a point in the upper half plane. So we take this whole thing and we just set w equal to m tau. Um, and by the way, since in our application, with this whole expression that k is even, this is true. If k is odd, this is true and not trivial. It's not like both sides are zero over here. So when we're summing over everything here when k is odd, this whole thing is zero and boring. But uh, here we have a valid um, identity even if k is odd. For us, k is even, so we can ignore the minus sign in the application here. Um, and so what we get is 2 pi i k, over k minus 1 factorial, summing n at least 1, and we get n to the k minus 1, e to the 2 pi i n, m tau. Whoosh. And so let's, let's combine the terms here. So let's, let's first take out this factor. And now, I'm going to have a sum over m, and a sum over n. n to the k minus 1, e to the 2 pi i m n tau. And I would like to make this sum indexed by these products. So let's give this a name. What would you like to call the product m little m times little n? P. So it's a number theory lecture. P is all the prime. So we will call it, what do you want to call it? R. Okay, R. You can call it P if you want, whoever said P, do that. Um, and so we get this factor, k minus 1 factorial. And so I'm going to do the outer sum over R, and I'll get my e to the 2 pi i r tau. And for each r, I have this expression multiplied by the integer factor of r to the k minus 1. So factors of r bigger than 0, so I'm just rewriting n as d, d to the k minus 1. So for every d going into r, I get a d to the k minus 1. Does that make sense where this is coming from? And so there we go. Um, and now since I don't like the letter r so much, it was nice to use it briefly, but we're going to go back now and call r little n. Since we've forgotten little n, we can now, uh, now use it. I'm going to change r to n. Just take the r and just put a little hook the bottom that magically becomes an n. And so now this is a sum over the divisors, so this is often written sigma sub k minus 1 of n, q to the n, where sigma k minus 1 of an integer 
is the sum over the divisors of the integer d to the k minus 1. And when I write a sum over divisors, I'm not interested in stupid stuff. I mean positive divisors. Okay? Um, especially if k is even, k minus 1 is odd. I don't really mean all divisors. Positive divisors. Okay, so this is called a divisor sum times e to the 2 pi i n tau. This thing here, this is the q to the r. And now we change r to n. So here we get the q expansion of the Eisenstein series. Okay. Um, and so what we see here is we see a value of the zeta function, some weird thing with pi's, and then these number of theoretic divisor sums. Okay, so this is one of the uh, reasons modular forms come up and are interesting in number theory, is that the coefficients of the Q expansions turn out to be, um, for some examples, turn out to be numbers of uh, arithmetic interest. So it turns out that these numbers, the zeta of k, this remember k is an even number, at least four. Um, and this, these are actually very closely related. Euler found the formula for zeta of k, like zeta of 2, zeta of 4, zeta of 6, even numbers, in terms of powers of pi. So let me remind you what that, what that formula is. And we'll use that to kind of clean this up. Um, a modular form is still a modular form if you, multi if you divide and multiply it by a non-zero constant. And so we might choose to normalize the modular form, for example, by dividing by the leading, leading constant term so that the constant term is normalized to be a 1. Okay? But before we do that, let me just recall for you what Euler showed. He showed that for k an even integer, he'd give a formula for zeta of k as an explicit, well, semi-explicit rational multiple of pi to the k. So here it is. It's uh, so I'll write minus 1 to the k over 2 plus 1. Don't worry, I know this is positive. Wait a second. That could be negative sometimes. Um, 2 pi to the k, b sub k, all over k factorial times 2. Where the b sub k's are certain rational numbers. In fact, here they are. Here, we don't need this boundary here anymore. Here they are. I didn't quite get the table to show up exactly where I needed it to have the talk. Um, and so the BKs are called Bernoulli numbers. This is called the, the k Bernoulli number. So it's a certain rational number, and it's, it's the rational number whose uh, exponential, exponential generating function is this. Right? x over e to the x minus 1. As a power series in x, declare the coefficient of x to the k to be BK over k factorial, and the BKs are Bernoulli numbers. And these numbers show up in that form. In fact, you might even say, wait, b sub k over k factorial shows up in that formula. So isn't it kind of stupid to write, why don't I just write c sub k for the whole thing and put that there? Well, the bk's are famous numbers, so, uh, so there you go. Um, and here's some initial examples. So if you actually wrote out this series, it starts off as 1 minus x over 2 plus x squared over 12 minus x to the 4 over 720, and so on. So for example, uh, b1 is minus a half, coefficient of x. b2, the coefficient of x squared over 2, is uh, 1 6. So there's b2. And in fact, all the bk's for odd, the odd Bernoulli numbers, odd index besides the first one, are all 0. So I didn't bother writing them in. And the even ones, here they go. You see minus a 30, shows up again. They look like small numbers. Oh, look at this, 691. If you ever see the number 691 in math, it means that there's a Bernoulli number hiding around. I don't know if the logicians can actually prove that, but it is an experimental fact. Okay? Um, nevertheless, these are kind of small numbers. Here's the first one that's bigger than 1. In fact, despite the initial data, um, the Bernoulli numbers do, in absolute value, uh, go off to infinity. Okay? They do eventually get quite large. And these funny minus signs, combined with the possibility that bk's are negative, this expression is positive as the zeta function has to be. So, um, so this is Euler's formula. And we can massage this to insert a 2 pi i in the formula. See, i to the k is minus 1 to the k over 2. So put a minus sign here, put a bk here, 
k factorial times 2. Clever there, since k is even, I can do that. Minus 1 times 1 times 2. And so what we can then do with this q expansion is, um, is write out this number as a value of the zeta function. Okay, so the, the Eisenstein series is 2 zeta of k. And if you're careful with the math, it's minus 4k zeta of k over vk. Using this formula, solving for the 2 pi i stuff, you can write it as a zeta value. Okay. And so there's the Eisenstein series where we've, we've written everything as a zeta value. And as I said before, one, of the, one way to normalize this since it's still a modular form if we just scale it, is to divide through the whole thing by 2 zeta k. Okay, this is called a normalized weight k Eisenstein series. It is e sub k of tau g k divided by its constant term and that will be 1 minus 2k over bk. So now what we see is all the irrationalities have disappeared. Okay, there is a modular form. As I said last time, so remember the tau is secretly here, e to the 2 pi i tau to the n. You cannot see from the q expansion that this is a modular form. Oh, you could see that this is holomorphic as a function of tau, e to 2 pi i tau. It's holomorphic in tau. It's periodic, tau going to tau plus 1. You cannot read off, though, the second condition that the value of minus 1 over tau is tau to the k times the original value. So when you write the q expansion, you make things somewhat opaque, but this is the, the standard way to write things down. And, uh, and so sometimes when people say Eisenstein series, they mean this one the one where you've kind of eliminated all the irrationalities. Um, and let's take a look at first few values of k minus 2k over bk. So by first few, I mean where the k is meaningful at 4 and 6. So what is this at 4? Anybody plug in minus 1 over 30 and do the math? It's a math program, so you have to be able to do the math. What do you get? Anybody? Looking for, huh? You get 240? Yep, I agree. Now for 6, plug in 1 over 42. Negative 5, of course, I look at my notes to see that it's right. <laughs> Negative 504. Hey, oh, oh, that's cool. They're integers. Well, they're only integers because of the accident, but the initial Bernoulli numbers are unit fractions. You see, once you get to here, or actually, the 5 is going to cancel out because um, you can have a 10 in the up numerator. But this one, this BK is a 691 upstairs, so when, the, when you flip it over, this will have a coefficient that is not an integer anymore. So the initial normalized Eisenstein series have integer, entirely integral Fourier coefficients, but it's not always true because that, that 691, the telltale marker of the Bernoulli numbers, as I think Andre Day once put it. So let's write out the first few, the initial Q expansion terms for some of the low weight normalized Eisenstein series. Okay, so if you actually plug in to so the first few values, I'll, I'll just report the, uh, the first few results. So E4, so if 1 plus 240 Q plus 2160 Q squared, and so on. I'll do E4, E6, and E8. And E6 is 1 minus 504Q 
minus 16632q squared. So the suggestion here is that these really are they're always going to be integers because the formula has all integers. Those divisor sums are integers. So if the 2k over b sub k is an integer, everything is integers. So the dot, dot, dots are mysterious larger integers. 1 plus 480q plus 61920q squared, and so on. I give the, the, I think, up through E12, the initial Q extension coefficients in the lecture notes. Um, OK, so <laughs> what's interesting about these series? Again, just to emphasize, this, this is 1 plus 240 times the sum of n at least 1 Sigma 3n q to the n. So maybe I should just write them all out. 1 minus 504, summing n at least 1, sigma 5n, right? Sigma k minus 1. This is 1 plus 480, summing n at least 1, sigma 7 of n q to the n. They're all integers, but once you hit E12, you're going to have a, a leading coefficient with a denominator of, of 691. Okay. So what? Well, what we see now is that modular forms give rise to an infinite sequence of numbers, namely the Fourier coefficients. In practice, the way modular forms might show up, for example, in combinatorics, is through generating functions. Some coefficients of combinatorial or number theoretic interest, if you put them in as the coefficients of a power series, and think about the variable as a complex variable in the unit circle, and then pull that back to a point in the upper half plane, think about q as e to the 2 pi i tau, the generating function is sometimes a modular form. Okay? So this accounts for the role of modular forms arising in places where we have generating functions, um, if it happens that it, it, it turns out to be a modular form. So let's set m sub k to be the, um, the set of all modular forms of weight k for SL2z. And this is, uh, this is a complex vector space. Obviously, you can take linear combinations of modular forms. As long as they have the same weight, the linear combination will again be a modular form. So the, the crucial theorem is that these spaces of modular forms of a given weight are all finite dimensional. So as examples, the space M4 is one dimensional. M6, one dimensional. M8, one dimensional. M10, one dimensional. M12, two dimensional. Okay. M14, one dimensional. And for higher M, it's at least two. Okay. 14 is the last time modular forms of uh, weight K are uh, one dimensional for SL2C. So, what does it mean that these are one dimensional, for example? It means that. Any two modular forms of these weights where you see the one, they're equal up to scaling. So for example, if the constant terms are the same, all the higher coefficients are the same. So let me show you an example of using this idea. E8 is in M8. Right? By construction, E sub k is a normalized <coughs> series of weight k belongs to Mk. But also, if you have two modular forms, if you have a modular form of some weight and another modular form of some weight, and you take their product, that will be a modular form of the sum of the weights. Just think about multiplying the modularity conditions to see tau plus d exponents add, and everything else is a boundedness, multiplies still bounded. And so, if you take E4 and multiply it by itself, that's also in M8. Now take a look at this. If you square this sucker, okay, what's the constant term of this thing when you square it? It's 1. But if you square it, what happens to the linear term? You double it. You double 240, you get 480. 
Okay? So it turns out, since E8 and E4 squared are both in the one-dimensional space, and 8 and the constant terms agree, it tells you that E4 squared is equal to E8. Okay? So, just from, you don't even need to look at the linear coefficients. They must be equal. Because the constant terms are both 1. So they're equal up to scaling, and since they agree in the degree 0 term, they agree everywhere. And so this is actually, by looking at, see E4 involves the sum of the cubes of the divisors, E8 involves the sum of the uh, seventh powers of the divisors. So this expresses actually an infinite collection of weird combinatorial identities, combinatorial <coughs> matter. It, 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 it encodes an infinite set of relations between the sigma threes equal to a sigma seven. Okay, so if you actually square E4 symbolically, and look at the coefficient and work it out, that has to be the sigma 7 to n. So you get these, these identities between divisor sums, the seventh power, and they're equal to some complicated kind of convolution sum of divisor sums with third powers. Okay? And it would also work with e4 times e6 would equal e10. I haven't written down e10 for you, um, but it must be equal because e4 times e6 lies in m10 and e10 lies in m10 and have the same constant term and therefore they must be equal. But the space of weight 12 modular forms is two dimensional, and so you're not guaranteed that two modular forms, say, with the same constant term of weight 12, are equal. For example, E4 cubed, E4 cubed, E6 squared, and E12 are not equal. in M12, but because it's a two-dimensional space, um, e, they all have constant term one. It doesn't mean that they're equal. They really aren't. Their linear coefficients are all different. The constant terms are all equal. The linear coefficients are all different. And so what that means then is they're, I'm telling you that there's a two-dimensional space. And so, in fact, any two of these could be a basis for that space. And so, it is possible to write E12 as a linear combination of E4 and E6 for some coefficients A and B, and you can work out what they are by comparing degree 0, 1 equals A plus B, and degree 1, uh, degree 1 uh, coefficient would be something like uh, 65520 six, six, over 691 is A times uh, uh, a times uh, 720 plus B times minus 1008. Anyway, but you can work out the A and the B just from looking at the constant term and the linear coefficient. And, there, and then that A and B will work, give you the identity, and therefore you get a formula for the E12 coefficients in higher degrees and the same linear combination of the coefficients for E4 cubed and E6. Oh, well, why did I say E6 cubed? E6 squared in, in higher degrees. 